Right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I should uh, start by introducing myself. I'm Roger Shepard, I'm the founder and managing director of Chipless Limited. Um, I, many, many years ago, graduated with a degree in mathematics. Uh, I joined a startup chip company, not like fish and chips, silicon chips, uh, here in Bristol. That company changed hands a couple of times, changed names a few more times, but I stayed there until it closed down um, at the end of March last year. And since then, um, I've been doing some consulting and working on developing a product to help people secure connected things. Um, my time in the silicon business, I worked on computer architecture, CPU design, software development, and system designs. A lot of time I spent on uh, parallel systems, uh, which have become um, trendy and, and commonplace again. Uh, this is a big computer system installed in Barcelona in an old chapel, uh, which is kind of interesting because uh, maybe these computers have become the thing that we go to worship these days. Um, I'll tell you a bit about what I'm going to talk about. Um, I want to talk about what happened here in Bristol in the 1980s when there was a, a large development of parallel processing, both of hardware and of software. Um, it was pretty successful by a number of, of reasonable measures, but the success didn't last, and I'll mention why not. And then look at why um, parallel processing has been reborn. Uh, in fact, out of necessity, um, and then look at some of the things that we're doing at the moment that are just plain wrong, and um, we ought to have learned from what went on previously. So let me start by moving way back to the invention of the computer. Um, and the first thing I want to talk about is Alan Turing. This is Alan Turing when he was about 16. And during the 30s, he developed a model of computation, very abstract. The idea was that you had a, a tape, infinitely long tape. Um, you had something that could read and write the tape and had some rules about what happened. So it would read a symbol, apply the rule, and then move the tape one way or the other or, or write something on the tape. And he determined that with these rules, you could do things like perform computations. Um, more remarkably, um, with the universal Turing machine, he showed that you could program one of these machines, that is, you could produce a set of rules for this machine, so it could imitate the behavior of any other machine. What it did was the symbols on the tape, it treated as a program and interpreted them, so one machine could perform any program. A very important um, step forward. Actually, the real reason I've talked about Alan Turing is I wanted to show this picture, which is a modern implementation of a Turing machine. It uh, has an Arduino uh, controller, has a camera and a pen. Um, and uh, you can uh, go and look this up. It's quite amusing to watch the, uh, the video of this incredibly high-tech piece of equipment imitating a 1930s Turing machine. Um, so... Turing provided some theory that it was worth building computers. Von Neumann um, showed how to do it. So uh, the von Neumann architecture was a stored program computing machine, had a single processor and a memory, a randomly accessible memory which contained programs and data. And we can regard it as an efficient realization of Turing's concept. So we had a practical implementation that we could build from the electronics of the, the 1940s uh, that was a, a practical computer. One of the very important things about um, these um, computers, the Turing machine and the um, von Neumann machine, is they're universal. They're general purpose. They can do anything subject to having enough memory and being fast enough, but they can do anything. And that means that a, a general purpose von Neumann machine can often replace special purpose hardware. And as the computers have got more capable, they've got faster, they've got more memory, um, they can 
uh, apply themselves to, or they can be applied to uh, more applications. We don't need a special computer for each application. And it's that that's led to the um, software eating the world. And in fact, today we've seen you know, physical objects, telephones, notebooks, watches, cameras, atlases, Walkman, being replaced by um, icons on a touch screen. So software really is eating the world, and that's made possible by the fact that these computers are universal. Now, one thing I'd like to point out about um, Turing machines and von Neumann machines is they talk about computation, but they don't talk about communication. So how is a computer supposed to interact with the outside world? And a lot of what we do today is about computers interacting with things. And from the um, point of view of, of parallel programming, parallel systems, how would two computers interact with each other if they were going to uh, cooperate to solve a single problem? Um, Turing and von Neumann don't really say anything about that. So leaving um, that aside, I want to move forward to 1979 when um, I started work and, and look at what the world was like then to give you an idea of, of what we were working with um, when uh, we started uh, to develop these, these systems. Um, some of you, a few of you look like you might remember <coughs> 1979. I barely do. <laughs> uh, and um, a lot of you weren't around, so I think it's useful to get some idea because things were different then. Um, I was a lot younger. Um, but one thing was it was not a secret that computers uh, were about to change the world. The development of microelectronics was going to make it possible. In fact, you could read it in the magazine. So New Scientist in 1972. I probably read this because I think I'd just started subscribing then. But it said, if microelectronics can make small computers as inexpensive as telephones, then people will buy them. Once in the house or small office, new uses will be found for them. And eventually, they will affect life to an even greater extent than the TV set has. So this has happened. Now, not everyone believed it at the time because it's patently ridiculous. I mean, it's patently obvious now, but it was patently ridiculous at the time. Um, so people were expecting things. Um, we'd seen the, the birth of the personal computer, 1977. Apple introduced the Apple II. And interesting things about it were, you know, obviously had one processor in it, four kilobytes of RAM and $1,300. And please remember that price point. It's very important. Um, you had to bring your own screen to that. Um, but already... Um, we were seeing the rapid improvements in semiconductor technology bringing down the, the price of computer components and bringing down the price of, of computers. So a couple of years later, the Apple II Plus, 10 times as much RAM, slightly cheaper. Um, and 79 was, was a year when it was sort of recognised that what was happening in microelectronics and chip design was beginning to be very challenging. We were putting so many components on a chip that we didn't really know how to handle the, the scale and complexity. Um, we were seeing um, microprocessors, 8-bit microprocessors coming up, and um, we were seeing the 64 kilobit DRAM coming on the market. I don't know where we are at the moment, but it's presumably around 4 um, gigabits, so 64 kilobit to gigabit, a million fold over uh, less than a working life. Incredible. Uh, fortunately, in 1980, this book came out, Introduction to VLSI, designed by Mead and Conway, which taught us how to deal with the complexity of design. A great book. Uh, 1981, the IBM PC, quite an expensive machine, you know, $1,500. Um, but this sort of legitimised the, the microcomputer and, and caused a revolution. More interesting, maybe, was the BBC Micro came out at that time. Um, 
cheap machine, although it must be said at that time £335 was quite a lot of money. Um, processor RAM. And very interestingly, it had networking in it, which was a, a real piece of insight. Um, the story I've heard is that um, Bill Gates visited Acorn to try and persuade them to use MS-DOS. And uh, they said, well, we, we can't, you know, it's too primitive. He said, why? What, what do you mean? He said, well, we've got networking. And he said, what's networking? <laughs> so, And indeed, as far as the Americans were concerned, it hadn't really been invented yet, because it was a year later that Ethernet was introduced to the world. Um, so that gives a flavour of how primitive things were and, and where we were working. But um, at that time, in, in that background, we started to develop parallel processing here in Bristol. And um, the work that went on is, is probably why Bristol became a, a technology hub with, with people spinning out into hardware industries, software industries and things. Um, the company that did it was a company called Imos. It was set up by the UK government with £50 million of venture funding, which was a lot of money in those days, um, because the government thought that microelectronics was an important industry and the correct way to do it was to fund a, a startup, which is what they did. The company was based in Bristol. It was an integrated semiconductor company, so it manufactured, it had fabs, design, selling chips, and the business was to be in memory chips and processor chips. Now I want to talk about the, the processors. Processors, microprocessors introduced, what, early 70s, and the analysis that the uh, Inmos founders had was that um, everyone would be producing very similar products and that Inmos should do something different. So the expectation was that people would be producing von Neumann machines um, and they're beginning to look like mini computers on a chip and that Inmos should do something different. What should it do? Um, it should focus on building a component for electronic systems. So just as electronic systems were built out of gates. The idea was that these components would be put together to build systems. So it would be a single chip building block. It would consist of a processor, memory and communication. Um, and um, it was to be called a transputer, which is transistor computer. And the idea was that they would connect together to form parallel systems, programmable parallel systems. Um, now, I'll return to the, the transputer a little bit later. Uh, this is a picture of one from about 1985. That's a pound coin um, to give you an idea of, of how big it was. Um, the thing about programmable parallel systems is that they have to be programmed. And this is true today. So this is one of... Um, you know, this is a picture from inside um, Wikimedia's server farm, and somehow the system has to be programmed up. Um, and uh, when I was doing a bit of background reading in preparation, I came across uh, an article that said, distributed computing is becoming the dominant programming model through the entire software stack. Uh, it might be a bit strong, but it is now commonplace. But we weren't concerned with programming this sort of thing. We were concerned with programming this sort of thing, which is 42 transputers on a single board. How do you go about programming that to run a program and solve a problem? How, how do you get these processes to cooperate with each other? And the bad news was in 1979, most microprocessors were programmed in assembler. And we knew assembler program was difficult and unproductive. We knew concurrent programming and parallel programming were difficult and prone to very tricky problems, such as data corruptions, deadlocks. So, quite a challenge. However, uh, it wasn't completely bleak. There had been work done on this topic over the years. In the early 60s, uh, Dijkstra had uh, come up and codified the idea of semaphores. Some people still use them for programming, but there you are. In 1967, um, 
Dahl and Nygaard produced um, Simula 67, which is um, arguably the um, granddaddy of all of the object-oriented programming languages, um, but it had these uh, concepts, particularly of classes. In the beginning of the 70s, uh, Brinch Hansen um, took the concept of monitors that Tony Hoare had, had come up with and extended um, the, some of the ideas out of S Simula, um, adding monitors into his uh, concurrent programming language, uh, concurrent Pascal. Uh, 73, Carl Hewitt came up with the actor model, which is much loved by the, much loved by the proponents of, of Scala. Um, and in 1978, uh, Tony Hoare came out with something called communicating sequential processes. Um, much of this was done to um, address how you programmed an operating system. Um, so uh, when a, a computer was multi-programming, when it was running multiple tasks between it, uh, sorry, multiple tasks on it under an operating system, how you could program those things clearly and securely. Um, distributed systems are a bit uh, harder uh, again. But uh, Hall's work addressed this. And um, this is a book that uh, came out probably early 80s, but uh, as a comment, the most obvious application of the new ideas is specification design and implementation of computer systems which continuously act and interact with their environment. So it's a much more reactive idea. The idea that inputting and outputting is important is embodied in, in this. Um, it's rather a theoretical approach. This is not describing a practical programming language. It's a theoretical approach. But Inmos decided what it had to do was produce a high level, i.e higher than assembler, not a Haskell-like language. High-level programming language that could be used for programming these parallel systems. So it must took um, the ideas of um, communicating sequential processes to provide a theoretical platform on which David May constructed a language called Occam, which was a practical programming language. Now, one thing I'd like to stress is that, that the hardware and the software were developed together. So this was full stack development <laughs> down to the hardware. Um, and it's pretty important that you do that, in my opinion. Um, certainly, when defining a language, you should have regard to the implementation. It's very easy to define languages which have horrible implementation problems are very inefficient. And this is particularly true if you're trying to implement them in a distributed manner. You can make assumptions that just aren't right if you just look at implementing on one processor. And the other way around, if you're building hardware, it's very easy to, to build hardware which looks really fast and super, but you can't program. Step forward GPUs. Um, so doing it together meant that the language supported distributed systems and had, an in, uh, and had an efficient implementation, ensured that the transmitter could be programmed, supported concurrent programming efficiently, and supported distributed systems. Um, and so we had a book on, on Occam 2, the second version, um, and it says Occam enables an application to be described as a collection of processes where each process executes concurrently and communicates with other processes through channels. So again, the emphasis on the interaction more than the pure computation. So uh, the language had a, a number of concepts in there. The, the key ones uh, I'll talk about in a sec. My idea here is to give a flavor of the programming language, not to go through a full interaction so you can go away and, and try and write a compiler for it and then, then program it. Um, but I, I want to talk uh, about some of the things uh, that address parallel programming. So process is uh, it's an abstract computation. Um, it could be just an assignment or it could be the whole system. It's a process. Um, the other terms that people are probably more familiar with, um, well, Process is, is, be familiar with that as what runs on, on Linux, but that's far heavier weight, or a task is far heavier weight. Even a thread is too, too heavy weight for the 
you know, the light end of processes, and threads carry the connotation of sharing memory. And that's something that the uh, Occam processes uh, don't do. Um, processes could communicate each other with each other via uh, name channels. Um, you can compose processes together to get bigger processes, and they could be composed in particular in sequence. They say, do this, then this, then this, then this, which is what most programming languages do. The only thing most programming languages do, do things in sequence. Um, in Occam, you could say, do these things concurrently, do them in parallel, just as easily as you could say, do it sequentially. Um, explicit non-determinism. So those of you who know concurrent programming know that often you'll execute a program, it will have one result. You'll execute the program again, it will have another, another result, even though all the inputs were the same, due to the way that the schedulings happen. In Occam, that could happen only if you use particular constructs in the, the language. Otherwise, it was deterministic what happened. I mean, obviously, if the data input was different, the result could be different, but the behavior was independent of scheduling, um, which is a, an important thing that has been lost <laughs> on people since. Also, the language had a, a semantic, so it had a meaning, um, which is important because it means that it was possible to reason about the program both for the programmer and also machines could do it to help establish um, proofs and equivalents. Um, so the language um, assignment, I said, so, you know, variable equals expression. You'll note the um, algol-like uh, assignment operator. Um, and at the same kind of level, we have input. So we have channel, take a value from a channel and store it in a variable, so keyboard um, channel produces a value stored in keystroke, and output the other way around, output the value 42 on this channel here. Um, these are synchronized, so that cannot happen until somebody gives it some data, the other side of the channel happens, and the output waits until the input is ready. Um, so there's no implicit buffering in there. Sequence, as I said, sequence uh, allows processes to be bind, combined so one follows another. So this, ah, you'll notice that the designers of Occam nipped forward into the future, saw the syntax of Python and decided indentation was a good idea, nipped back and stole the idea. Um, but, so, Seek introduces a sequence of processes, in this case, input a character followed by output the character. So we input from the keyboard, then output to the screen. So this has to complete before this can start sequence. This is implicitly what, as I said, most programming languages do. They do things in sequence. Occam's novelty was you could write parallel. So here we write the editor keyboard and screen running in parallel, and they're connected by these two channels. Um, and um, one of the important things that, that Occam said was when you have a parallel, if there's a variable which is assigned to or input to in this process, it cannot be used in the other processes. In other words, there is no shared mutable state in this language, um, which is a very good thing. Uh, channels, I mentioned channels, but it's it said they're unbuffered, unidirectional, point-to-point -point communication between two concurrent processes. It turns out that when you start to use channels, one of the bugs that you introduce to your program very easily is you're not using them correctly. One process is expecting a particular sequence of information, the other process are different. So uh, the language has something called a protocol um, which defined the types and sequences of values to be passed on a, on a channel. Um, it's not, the protocols aren't the same as a, a compound data type, uh, but have certain similarities. But they allowed us to check at compile time for the correct usage of channels. So a number of programming errors could be picked up by the compiler and also meant that the 
uh, logical structure of a message could be different from the actual way it was transmitted. The compiler could look after that. Um, as I said, um, you, when you combine processes, you get another process. So um, uh, you could combine um, a parallel within a sequence. So this little program here um, inputs a value outputs the square of the previous value in parallel, um, copies the variable over and repeats. So we're overlapping the inputting and the computation of the square there. Um, now, those of you who are um, used to using uh, sort of fairly conventional implementations today look at that and think, oh, God, that's so expensive. That must be terrible. I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, the final language feature I want to mention, um, rather technical, uh, but I'll mention it because I want to return to it later, um, is an al alternation. This is, if you know um, Go, this is like a Go select. Um, and this says either input from channel top or from channel bottom, and then um, do this. So in both cases, it'll uh, input a packet from top and output it to stream. So this is a multiplexing function. And um, you can write something that looks very like that in Go, in Scala, reasonably easy to do. Um, so what happens is, um, if nothing's ready, it'll wait. If something's ready, it'll choose one of the inputs and proceed. Uh, now in Occam, these guards, as they're called, um, are restricted to being inputs. In CSP, the theory behind the language allows both inputs and outputs in these guards. But Occam had um, just inputs, and I'll explain why. Uh, later. It's not a theoretical issue, it's a practical issue. Um, on semantics, um, the heritage of CSP brought a formal semantics. So formally, in a, a real mathematical sense, um, this piece of concurrency where we um, send the value 42 on channel C and input the value into X is equivalent to this assignment. Um, under the, the right model. So you can think of message passing as being a distributed assignment, uh, which is useful. And there were a number of um, you know, books printed about the laws of Occam programming, uh, Bill Roscoe and Tony Hoare, a pursuit of deadlock freedom. So the issue of deadlock in concurrent systems is, is one of, of great difficulty. People will be familiar with this, I guess. And a lot of work was done to try and establish uh, under what conditions you could know that your system was deadlock free. And in fact, the work, the theoretical work on this has continued over the years, still goes on. Um, there's still a lot of work going on um, on CSP because it's of, of great uh, theoretical interest. So that's um, enough of the software for the moment. I want to get back to the story. Um, Inmos wasn't a software company, it was a chip company. <laughs> and the hardware was rather Im important. Um, that was, was where the company would make its money. And there were a lot of challenges that were faced in designing the transputer. Um, the physical size of a device combining compute, memory, and communications was, was challenging. At that time, people were producing single chips that were just a microprocessor. Um, we also had to deal with the fact that we wanted communications to work chip to chip. So we had to work out how to create a, a fast system to do that. Um, and actually the sheer design complexity was an issue. And there's a lot of stories to be told there, like we built the workstations, we built the operating system, we built the networking system, we built the CAD system, blah, 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 blah. All done so that we could handle this sort of complexity. Um, but it worked. Um, this is what came out, so the, the transmuter, um, the major, I don't know how many, how many of you have ever seen chip photos and know anything about them? Not a lot, well, maybe 50%. So 
Anyway, um, this is um, what uh, it would sort of look like if you looked at the chip. And what you see here is this is the memory. This part is the processor, and that's the microcode. And this is the communication system, and all the stuff around the edge is the pads to get signals on and off the chip. But um, inside this, we had a scheduler for the concurrent system. It was non-busy. Occam does not require polling, um, busy polling. So when the uh, processor has nothing to do, it really has nothing to do. It doesn't have to spend its energy going, oh, have I got something to do? Oh, no, it's quiet. Um, a process... A, a concurrent process obviously it needs you know its data and program, but there's some overhead there as well to support the fact it's a process. And on the transputer, the overhead was between two and five words, not kilobytes, <laughs> words. Uh, the channel that enabled two concurrent processes to communicate on chip, one word. Um, the external channel ended up being implemented by two wires joining the two chips together, and this would convey um, data at 20 megabits a second, which back in the mid-80s was fast. Um, and the software didn't see the difference between an internal channel or an external channel. It was all the same. That The program executed an input instruction and the processor took care of whether it was internal or external. So it was nicely abstracted. And um, the slides in here really, because I wanted to introduce the name T800, because that happens on the next slide. <laughs> and to give you some idea that, well, give, give some credence to the idea that maybe um, there was some success in, in what we did. Um, so what was happening is uh, people were applying lots of transputers to some fairly high performance problems, signal processing, data processing, and it turned out it would be really useful if we had floating point performance. So um, we ended up implementing a transputer with hardware floating point. And this is the uh, front cover plus some other bits of IEEE Micro from October 1987 where the T800 was launched. Um, and um, a complete scientific computer on a single chip forms the basis of the most powerful supercomputer in Europe. Great. Uh, but for, for all the hype, it was actually very successful at this time and um, world class. I'd, I'd like to stress that, that as a, a processor, this, this had world class performance. Um, so before looking at some of the comparative benchmarks, this was a processor that ran at 20 megahertz, so a factor of 100 slower than it would run today. But it was loading a local variable in a couple of cycles, um, adding two 32-bit numbers together in one cycle. Um, it would start a process in 12 cycles. It would do the barrier <coughs> synchronization when two processes had to, to join together, 13 cycles. These, it could do, start a process and end it in less cycles than it could do a multiplication. So the cost of the concurrency in the system was very low. Uh, outputting a word, 25 cycles. So, so synchronization, scheduling was happening faster than multiplication on this machine. Um, still um, slower than doing floating point addition though. How did it compare with competition? So the most interesting, the most successful microprocessor company is Intel, and uh, they've been there for a long time. So the most interesting comparison here is probably against a 386 and a 387, because Intel had to use a second chip for their floating point unit. And um, comparing uh, the T800 with the 386, 387 on Whetstone, which was the um, floating point benchmark of, of the day, the T800 was more than twice as fast. On integer work on, on dry stone, we, we see a sort of similar figure, twice as fast. So this was a world-class um, device. 
Um, and uh, you may not know this, but at one time Pixar, what's now a film company, um, made uh, software and hardware. So parallel processing held the promise of vast leaps in performance. Um, and they, they were running um, render man on transmuter based hardware, 64 transmuters in it for one of their building blocks. So there was a lot of um, success. But, so we developed a system that provided a, a practical way to build parallel systems. They're used in a wide range of applications and research. There were things like numerical libraries, operating systems, supercomputers, image processing systems, all sorts. But, so where should we be now, 2015? As you probably know, the key thing that's happened in semiconductors is, is the circuits have got smaller and smaller and smaller. And between 1984 and 2012, we produced features that were a hundredth of the size linearly, so a ten thousandth of the size um, in area. So in 2012, we should have been able to put 10,000 transputers on a single chip. And for 2015, even more, because we build bigger chips and the technology's improved. And that's why you see all these huge numbers of multiprocessors in the PCs. Like the, the new Apple Mac announced yesterday. Um, so this has 8 million kilobytes of RAM. $1,300, same price as an Apple II. But you get a free screen with this one. And it has... oh four processors. So we have two million times as much memory, four times as many processors. What's been going on? What happened to the parallel machines? Well, Team Parallel was a bit outnumbered. Imos, the rest, which makes life difficult. Team Parallel also got rather slow. The successor to the T800 took six years <coughs> to come to market for various reasons, but uh, that's far too long. But you say, Roger, surely there were still people who wanted lots of increased performance. What were they going to do if, if Inbus wasn't coming up with the parallel systems? The short answer is that sequential performance improved regularly because of Moore's law and Denard scaling. Moore's law just said, will double the number of transistors uh, every year initially, and then in 75 you revise it to every two years. But what happened? Oh, look. <sighs> Lots of transistors to play with. And now you'll say, well, Roger, sure, all those transistors, why don't it use a lot of power? And the answer is no. <laughs> Turns out, in this seminal paper by Robert Denard, that... Um, Transistors get smaller, they switch faster, but they use less power to do it. And actually the power density remains the same. So if we were building that um, 10,000 transmuter chip, it would draw the same power as the original chip. Amazing. He also said that interconnects didn't speed up, but that didn't matter in 1974, but it matters now. And so what we've seen is a huge increase in CPU frequency. So you're able to get your performance out of frequency and out of um, in, in, increased processor complexity without having to do that dreadful parallel programming. We were competing with Moore's Law. We stopped the hardware effort, Pixar. So why are we doing any parallel processing now? Well, the answer is in this chart. This frequency stopped going up in about 2005. Processors haven't got higher frequency. They got a bit faster because they're using more transistors and being a bit cleverer about what they do, but it hasn't gone faster. So we're missing out about 10 years of, of performance. Uh, so we ought to be expecting processors now to be running at something like 20 gigahertz, and they're running at what, four? This is, so what did we have to do? We had to start building these data centers with huge parallel computers in them. 
And so we're having to relearn how to program. And I'm now over time, but I'll just complete this. <laughs> what are we forgetting about what we learned? Because we learned a lot in, in that period. Um, Brinch Hansen, who uh, designed Concurrent Pascal, took a look at Java. Uh, Java is not a new language, so this is, is going back a bit. In 1999, he um, wrote a paper about Java. And he says, the author examines the synchronization features of Java and find that they are insecure variants of his earliest idea in parallel programming, published 72 to 73. The claim that Java supports monitors is shown to be false. The author concludes Java ignores the past 25 years of research in parallel programming. Um, and unfortunately, there's a few cases of this around. Ah, shared mutable state considered harmful. 1974, Tony Hoare, writing in Hints on Programming Language Research, said, for a parallel programming language, the most important security measure, i.e., this isn't about hacking, this is about making sure your program runs like it's supposed to, is to check that processes access disjoint sets of variables only and do not interfere with each other in time-dependent ways. And a lot of people took this on board. There's lots of practical languages developed that allow this. Concurrent Pascal, Ada, Occam all have that property. Um, when I was doing some reading for this, I thought, oh, I better find out what they do in Scala. And I found this great quote, um, 2013. The predominant approach to concurrency today is of shared mutable state. I mean, how can you write this in 2013 when 40 years earlier, you were told, don't do it. Um, and as this goes on to say, it's very hard to get right. It certainly is. Uh, Go. Uh, Go seems to have ignored a lot about um, semantics from my point of view. So the select statement in Go, the alt that I mentioned, um, says if you encounter a select with more than one guard ready, you choose a single one that can proceed is chosen via a uniform pseudo-random selection. What are they on? You know, what, what matters if, what, what if it matters to you which one's chosen? How do you prioritize one input over another? How do you build a system that distributes it fairly? How do you even know it's working properly? You know, how do you observe it and say, oh yes, they have implemented it correctly. It really is a uniform pseudo-random distribution. Um, in Occam, you can um, annotate and alt, say, explicitly prioritize it. And if you have a prioritized rule, which is, is fairly firm what that means, you can sue over it and lets you build a fair system if you want, or an unfair system. Oh, go again. <laughs> go lets you have these output guards. This is really tricky. So imagine you have these three alternatives. So we have a channel D between these two. We output here, input here. E here and C here. We've got this cycle. And imagine this is on one processor, this is on another, and this is on another. How do you resolve what to do? You can't resolve it locally. <coughs> You've created something that you have to have a centralized solution for a distributed problem. <coughs> if you only have inputs, the resolution can be done locally and non-busily. And this is well documented. <coughs> um, seems to me that maybe the Go people didn't quite read all the um, literature on this. And the problems on the hardware side. For example, in the 1990s, there were a lot of moves towards building general purpose parallel machines. And one of the things that was shown was the communication capability had to grow n log n, where n is the number of processors. Nobody takes any notice of this when they're building parallel machines. They don't put enough communication in. It's a bit like trying to build a steam engine, ignoring the laws of thermodynamics. So apologies for going over. But in conclusion, in the 1980s, Bristol built successful parallel hardware and software. In the 90s and 2000s, Moore's Law and Denard scaling delivered ever faster computers and the demand for parallel machines almost disappeared. 
but since 2005 the performance of computers hasn't kept up with demand and we've seen a resurgence of parallel computers. Unfortunately, a lot of what we learned in the 80s and in some cases earlier seems to have been forgotten. And with that, thank you very much for listening. No, I agree. Um, the, um, that wasn't an issue that we addressed then. Um, sorry, sorry the, the question was um, basically, uh, yes, but things are a bit different now. You know, I am building systems with 10,000 processes in them, and I have to deal with failures of processes. And you're absolutely right. Um, things aren't the same. Um, and there are real problems that are being addressed. Failures, um, having to live change what a system's doing, which is something that we didn't address at all. Um, so I think there's lots of new problems, um, but I don't think those problems are made any easier by ignoring things that, that we knew. Um, uh, and actually, it's, it's kind of uh, very interesting what's happened. The, 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 I think... Um, suddenly around programming languages, it's a lot more exciting now than it's been for a long time because people are um, designing languages and addressing problems. And also there's a lot, lot more people involved in it, which is great. When, when I saw the development of uh, Swift when it went public, huge numbers of people, hundreds of people, discussing it on forums. It would have been great to have had that when we were designing <laughs> Occam to actually have people you know, trying out and saying, oh, if you do this, it doesn't work. It was taking years to get that type of feedback. Um, so, so yeah, it's all different, but I, I'd still stick by the idea that, that there are some things that we learned that um, have been forgotten. I think, um, well, I'm not sure how much of a problem it is, <laughs> um, in that um, you, you can be overcautious. So, you know, there's something to be said about being gung-ho, try it, and oh, well, it works, it's great. The danger is that it worked so well in 10 years' time, you're still doing it, and it wasn't quite right in the first place. Um, so there's a balance. I think there's not quite enough... Um, looking at uh, things that have been done previously and not enough studying of the principles behind it. You know, it's like you, you look at, oh, that looks good, I'll copy that. Oh, you know, Hansen's monitors look really good, we'll use those. Oh, no, but you missed the key point. <laughs> um, uh, so you do see a lot of reinvention. But, but the other side, it's often a lot more work to try and dig out some information about how something was done than figure out how to do it again. So... Yeah. Sorry, you. Uh, well, it's a more general question, really. Cause I was kind of young in the eighties. So <laughs> I remember the transcripts on, on Tomorrow's World and so on. It was and it was incredibly exciting at the time. You also see it working. You know, it was quite inspirational. Um, so the question really is, um, I mean, it, that was effectively government funded, right? In most, it's seed capital was government funded. I've worked for a number of startups that have been fully private funded. Um, which is a different model, perhaps more or less pressure, I don't know. But was there, what, what was this in terms of the pressure like at the time to produce results and was it a bit more of an academic aspect? No, no, it was, I mean, it was, it was um, they were essentially venture capitalists. Right. Now, it got very complicated because um, the sort of approach to venture capital and strategic investment was being followed by the um, government that was in power in, I think, think IMOS was founded in 1978. This was the Callaghan government. Um, I remember an interview in Easter 79 asking the company the question, so when Labour 
lose the election, what's going to happen to your funding? <laughs> and um, the answer is, I mean, it's slightly bizarre. I mean, the answer was, oh, it's all secure, it's all okay. But actually, what happened was the Labour government were completely hands off. I mean, it was, here's the money, you know, go away and do it. The Tory government, non-interventional government, decided that, you know, the right thing was to start meddling with the company. So there was a lot of, there was a year, really, where the um, founders spent their time arguing with the government about whether the company should be moved to Newport. And it ended up with the factory, which was originally going to be in Bristol, big move to Newport, but they kept the, the design centre here. Um, so there was a lot of pressure. The other thing was the motivation of the staff was like it is in a startup. I mean, they were on founder stock. <laughs> you know, the, the three founders were up for making, uh, I think it was four million each, if, if the company reached its sales, um, its um, flotation target and uh, four million was a lot of money in those days um, so yeah, and people were working you know working silly hours um, yeah I think we're out of time so um, but if, if people want to speak to me afterwards please do